have you all join our another installment of Webinar Wednesday. This is our professional development webinar series for the college access and admissions community presented by collegegreenlight.com. Um, and we are back again with our second installment of our COVID-19 and college admissions info sessions. Uh, today's topic, COVID-19, so what's next? Supporting juniors and seniors in college admissions. And we are very grateful to have our admissions friends at McAllister provide insights on how access counselors like yourselves can best support our juniors and seniors during these challenging times. I am your host, Brittany Cleveland, the Senior Manager of Partner Engagement here at collegegreenlight.com, where we support the needs of over 15,000 registered college access counselors and 200 leading colleges and universities across the nation, providing free online college admissions and scholarship resources for first-generation and under-resourced college-bound students. Launched in 2012 by capex.com, our mission continues to close the information and opportunity gap across access counselors, students, and families. And if you're new to College Greenlight, we welcome you. Hello, howdy. Um, we are uh, really excited for you all to join today's uh, conversation. And we also welcome you and your students to create a free account at collegegreenlight.com. Yes, we are a website um, and uh, we exist for you and your students. Um, and once you all complete uh, your account, You'll gain access to our user-friendly online tools to help students find scholarships to pay for school, research diversity admissions programs, and explore virtual campus tours. Uh, and if you need any help creating your accounts, please type help <laughs> in the chat box to the right um, or contact our team at info at collegegreenlight.com to get started. All right, team, to maximize today's webinar, we have some housekeeping tips and goodies for you. I want to bring attention um, to everyone. Uh, if you all notice, there is a button at the bottom of your screen. If you all click on that button, that is going to allow you to download College Greenlight's COVID-19 Admissions Counselor Online Resource Hub. Um, it includes links to new worksheets and resources um, that are going to really help students and um, your team really navigate the different opportunities that are available for them and for your team. Um, I wanna highlight a couple of useful um, resources. Uh, first is our CapEx, um, uh, our parent company, they released a new student resource dashboard that includes virtual tours, updated uh, acceptance states and links to admissions, COVID policies and changes. Um, and if you all take a look, uh, uh, College Greenlight team put together a really great uh, uh, first gen student questions worksheet to help our seniors get their questions answered in order to make informed college decisions. And um, I'm really excited about this because College Greenlight is hosting our second installment of our online college block party. This is a free two-day online college knowledge event for high school students from all grade levels, parents, and counselors. And did I mention it's virtual? It's it, and it's free. Um, audience will gain expert advice from diversity admissions reps and current college students from Colgate University, Smith College, University of California, Berkeley, Emory University, Washington University, and St. Louis, and Tufts University. And we are really uh, pushing this to be more than just an info session. This is an educational session. We are inviting our colleges to really help empower our students and their families, as well as you and your team, to know what um, uh, is happening on the other side of the fence, to really inform um, our community about the different opportunities that are available, specifically when it comes to first-gen underrepresented students. Um, and so we will be uh, including topics um, from financial aid 
to um, the college application and how uh, COVID impacted uh, and influenced what it will look like and shape um, uh, in uh, fall of, uh, of this year, personal essay writing um, uh, assistance, um, college one-on-one -on -one for our Spanish speaking families. And we have tons um, a bit more. I'm actually showing um, an example of the schedule that we have on board. Um, we are going to be live on April 28th and April 29th. We want you all to please share. This is our community um, and we want to help inform our young ones um, and their families and your team as well. So counselors, if you're interested and you want to share this with your students, if you want to use this as a learning opportunity um, for your um, students and their families, we are more than welcome to assist you all. We will also help you batch register students. Um, and if you all need any assistance, just please email us at info at collegegreenlight.com or you can um, type in block party in the chat box and one of our representatives at College Greenlight will follow up with you all. Um, in order to access the registration link or just more information, you all can find the registration link in that button below um, there. Just click on that in that resource hub to um, find that link. All right, team. So here's um, some housekeeping tips. Um, we want you all to know that uh, uh, we understand that if there's an emergency, you need to leave. Um, we will be following up with you all um, with the recording and the slides to review. Um, if you visit our YouTube page, um, just type in College Greenlight all of our archived um, videos are there and you can share that with your team and your students um, just in case you don't receive that email. Um, in addition to that, um, we will also um, uh, like for you all to complete a survey at the end of the webinar to uh, let us know how we're doing and provide some best practices um, um, to our McAllister group on how we can improve today's presentation. All right, team. So I want to um, direct our attention to the main entree, and that is uh, with our amazing team here at McAllister. Um, and give me one second, I'm going to unmute our team here. All right, so joining um, the stage is our dynamic duo, Ben Kaufman and Yara Williams from McAllister admissions team. Um, and behind the scenes is uh, Jace Riggin and Adam, Adam Vanderslew, um, who is in the chat room, and they'll be answering your questions as well. Um, they're really excited to talk with you all in more details on how we can best support our students in these very challenging times, um, especially the uncertainty of COVID-19. So without, um, without <laughs> further ado, um, Ben Niara, I'll have you guys go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you to College Greenlight for uh, working with us to put together this webinar. I'm um, really, really happy to, to be here, be chatting with you folks. To introduce myself, my name is Ben Kaufman. I am one of the admissions officers at McAllister. I'm in my third year as admissions officer. My recruitment territory includes much of the American West, um, not California, but the Pacific Northwest, the Rocky Mountain Range, uh, and Alaska as well. Um, I actually spent my first year after graduating from Mac, which was in 2016, spent my first year out working with College Possible. Uh, so all you CP folks out there, hello, nice to see you. Thanks for chatting in. Um, yeah, it's a little bit about me, but on the College Greenlight, or excuse me, the, our community education outreach team within McAllister's office for the second year now. Hi, my name is Niar Williams. I'm also an admissions officer at McAllister College, and this happens to be my first year in working in higher education. I'm also a member of the Community Outreach and Education team, and I'm very excited to be working with you all today. My territory is generally slightly east of the Midwest, but you're not gonna hit the coast if you're in my territory. Mm -hmm. Well, to transition a little bit to what we're going to be talking today, here we are. All right. 
right. Um, so uh, a quick note to all of you folks. I know some of you are experiencing some technical difficulties with uh, buffering this presentation. Just know that this presentation is available to all of you to download. Um, and of course, a link will be sent out as well after the webinar. So if for some reason your connection is not working perfectly, don't worry. We'll be able to get you the, the full recording of the webinar along the way. Um, but yeah, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Our presentation is about a, a student's college application, a Bill of Rights, which is a presentation that we were putting together uh, already and then rearrange that direction to include in the time of COVID-19, given that there are so many questions right now for what's going on with that. Um, so to give you a little breakdown of what the agenda for this webinar is gonna look like, um, we are going to just give a brief overview of McAllister's position in higher education, sort of some things that we've been doing over the past couple of years, uh, what our school is like in the first place, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with McAllister. Um, and then we will go into the Bill of Rights, talk about uh, sort of what that's going to look like. Um, we'll talk about our current moment, April 2020, uh, where we are today with COVID-19. Uh, and then we'll really break down into the actual different uh, Bill of Rights that we've put together. We put together 10 rights that students should know about when going into the application process and during the application process. So we'll touch on those. Uh, and we do leave some time at the end for questions. Uh, thank you all so much in advance for those of you who submitted questions ahead of time. Uh, Adam and Jace, who are doing the behind the scenes chat, did go through and collate some of those uh, into sort of three broad themes that we'll touch on. And then if there's extra time beyond that, uh, we'll also open it up to some other questions as well. Uh, but that's what the agenda looks like for the day. And I'm gonna have Niara then uh, let you know a little bit about McAllister. All right, thanks, Ben. Well, McAllister is a small private liberal arts college and there are a few things that make us pretty unique. We happen to be one of the few liberal arts schools in a metro area. And this makes us special in that we're able to provide a small tight knit community while our students still have access to all the amenities, opportunities and internships that come with living in an urban area. Our diverse student body represents individuals from all around the country and all over the world. And as a matter of fact, 31% of our student body is made up of people of color, which is a noticeable 59% rise from 2009. Also, we're a school that meets 100% of demonstrated financial need for all students. And a financial aid package from us will look something like a combination of grants, loans, work study, and an expected family contribution. The average need-based package will cover $47,908 of a student's tuition. Merit scholarships are available and students are notified if they qualify for them at the time of admission. One more thing that makes us unique is that McAllister is a global leader among liberal arts colleges. We offer an intimate liberal arts experience between two bustling cities while cultivating a community of global citizens by providing a rigorous and holistic education. During the fall of 2007, um, during that reading season, we made the change to committee-based evaluation. We did this in the hopes of having our application review process provide a more balanced understanding of our applicant pool. And because of the extra attention, our collective office was able to give each student's academic and personal profile. The class that started in the fall of 2018 was the largest and most diverse class in McAllister's history. And there is an independent process that those students and counselors experienced on their way to matriculation. There are many things that students and counselors have the right to expect during the process of applying to an institution, and we will be calling these your Bill of Rights. At each step of the process, we'll talk about what a student can expect to receive from a college and what a student will want and need to ask for. But due to events beyond any of our control, what those things are, are shifting a little bit. As of our current moment, many things are new and many things are in flux due to the evolving nature of the global pandemic. Juniors who are just starting out in the college process are unable to visit the institutions they're applying to, and seniors are unable to visit any of the institutions that they've been admitted to. Colleges are closed, visiting is impossible, fly-in programs are no longer running, and in some cases, calling admissions offices is not possible. And we're all left wondering if there's any kind of silver lining to this. Well, there is, and we will be reviewing what some of that entails in our presentation today. 
but at this point in time, I'm going to hand off the presentation to my colleague, Ben, who will begin our discussion of your Bill of Rights. Great, thanks, Niara. Uh, so we'll jump into to the first three rights that we've put together, which are focused on uh, juniors and rising seniors. Starting the college search, you'll notice we are gonna go sort of chronologically in the timeline, starting out with your current juniors and what they can expect over the next few months, and then circle back to what your current seniors are looking at uh, near the end. So you'll notice these three, first three rights we put together, uh, Article 1, that a student will easily find all relevant information about a potential college online, or at least they should be able to find that information pretty easily. The second article that we'll talk about, a student can always contact the admissions office to ask questions about anything they want to know. And then the third article for this section, a student can always request admissions materials from a given institution, and they certainly do not need to continue receiving those materials if they do not want to. And we'll talk about what that sort of looks like on the ground level. Um, so when it comes to Article 1, students should be able to easily find all relevant information, easily being a subjective operative word there, of course, but information, um, some information that colleges report are actually mandated to report by the federal government. Um, so things like cost, graduation rates, uh, there is this clause called the College Affordability and Transparency uh, that just details that colleges are in fact required to report a lot of this information um, and that it's really important that uh, students know that some of these pieces of information should absolutely be accessible and easy to find on a college website. Uh, so to move to the next slide, we'll actually see a list of some of those things that colleges should be reporting and, and frankly must be reporting. Uh, net price calculator, four-year and other graduation rates. In this day and age, a lot more colleges are actually reporting six-year graduation rates instead of four-year graduation rates. Um, so just be mindful of that, that students might not be able to find a four-year graduation rate, in which case they should be able to find a six-year or in rare cases, maybe even a five-year graduation rate. Uh, data on starting salaries and graduation outcomes, where students end up, retention rate funnels into, into this information that should be reported, disability and accommodation services available to students. And then we get to this wonderful little booger colored and shaped icon at the bottom left of your screen there. Um, that'll indicate points that we put together in this presentation that specifically relate to our time in coronavirus uh, situation. Um, so particularly in this time, any policy changes that colleges make in response to COVID-19 should be reported on their website. Things like deadline changes for applications or deposits, uh, any kind of deposit fee reductions, whether a school is going to be test optional uh, for the next cycle because of examinations being canceled. This is information that, that should be reported on a college's website that a student should be able to find on their own and or with the assistance of you counselors, of course, as well. Uh, and then moving on to a final slide about this first right here, uh, just other items to be thinking about that you can chat with your students with or, or chat with various cohorts with. Um, a list of academic programs that are offered at the college and university should be pretty easy to find and accessible. Um, some list of academic programs might be very colorful. They might have pictures. They might have great stories or video uh, clips, and some will not. Some will be fairly basic. And so just the understanding for your students that this information should be available, but it's not always going to look the same on every single website. Uh, graduation requirements, as mentioned briefly earlier, um, this goes into what kind of credits are required to graduate? What kind of classes do I have to take? Is there a core curriculum? Um, what do I have to take for my majors and or my minors to make this happen as well? Uh, numbers about student body diversity and student body size uh, should be reported on websites that students, your students should be able to find this information as well, uh, including number first gen students, Pell Grant receiving students, those might be proportional numbers as opposed to just hard numbers. Um, transfer of credit policies and articulation agreements, institutional accreditation, all this kind of information, whether administrative or easily accessible for students to look at and for students to utilize on your end should be pretty easily available online. Again, every website is different, but it should only take a couple clicks to get to this kind of information. When working with your students, again, with the knowledge that in the time of COVID that we're working with right now, since your students can't visit campuses, and for a lot of schools, McAllister included, you might not even be able to call up an admissions officer because we're all working remotely. So being able to find information like this is a great starting point, particularly for your juniors who may be early in their college search process right now. Then we move on to Article 2, uh, students can contact admissions with questions. This seems pretty self-explanatory, but um, I know in, in large part 
over my years of experience, what I've discovered is a lot of students uh, don't feel comfortable asking questions of admissions or, or don't know what questions to ask. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that here. Um, all colleges and universities have some kind of system in place that, uh, to be able to field questions, whether via email or phone call. Again, in the time of COVID-19, phone call may be less accessible, but emails are certainly uh, available and open for student communication. Admission staff really should be making themselves available to students and parents with questions, and this is nationwide. I know at McAllister specifically, we are doing everything in our power to be open to communication from students, even in this weird time, doing everything we can to make sure that we're available during work hours uh, and also available to answer these questions that, of course, are incredibly important for your students uh, to be asking. Uh, so email, phone conversation. In the time of COVID, McAllister is one of many institutions that's putting together virtual programming like an online video chat uh, where one of your students, um, whether a junior in the process or even an admitted senior at this point, might actually be able to sign up for a virtual chat through Zoom or Skype or whatever it may be to chat with an admissions counselor and ask the questions that they have on their mind. Once things settle back into a normal routine, assuming we do get to that point, in-person visits and events will pick back up again. And those, of course, are an excellent option for your students. Uh, allowing admission staff to connect students with other departments and offices is a great resource and something that students should be asking about, whether or not they can get connected to a professor or current student in a specific academic field or student support resource. Um, we want to be advocates for students as much as we can on this side of the aisle, this side of the table while also navigating the application decision process, we, we know how important it is that we are here as a resource. So we try to make that happen as much as we can. Uh, and then again, in the time of COVID, make sure uh, either you, but certainly your students should be checking admissions web pages as often as possible uh, because new ways to virtually connect are being launched on a weekly, if not a daily basis from McAllister, from other colleges and universities around the nation as well, knowing that this is now the primary, if not really the only method that we can get our message out there, that we can recruit students and yield students is to go through this virtual format. So your students should be aware that we are putting out, we in the general higher ed sense are putting out as much virtual programming as possible to make it more accessible. And then moving on to uh, the third article here for your rising juniors and seniors. Um, we really do encourage students to request more information um, from as many schools as possible to get on mailing lists, to start receiving some information. Um, most schools these days, most colleges have an opportunity when a student signs up for a mailing list for the student to specify fields of interest, extracurriculars that they might be interested in, so that then colleges and universities can send them specific mail as related to those interests as opposed to just general mail about the college, about the institution itself. Um, and usually there can be a way to sign up for the mailing list on a college's admission website. Uh, we certainly also encourage students to reach out uh, or, or make inquiries of specialized programs like an athletics program or an arts or music program um, and to sign up for specific lists that they might have as well. Um, at McAllister, we usually have just one general sign up list for our mailings. Other institutions might have um, in, might have sign up lists that are more categorized based on if you're interested in fine arts, here's the fine arts sign up list. If you're interested in athletics, here's the athletics sign up list. So definitely make sure if you haven't already to, to let your students know that there might be multiple mailing lists that they could sign up for, that they might want to sign up for to get as much specific information as possible. Uh, and then finally related to all the mail that colleges send, all the mail that your students get um, in the snail mail, in email, et cetera, students are always welcome to opt out of getting these mailings. Um, you know, again, that's fairly self-explanatory, but it's not the easiest sometimes for a student to say, I really don't wanna get this mail right now, or maybe I'm not interested in your school, please don't send me mail, but that's kind of a difficult ask to make for a lot of students. Um, but they should know that this is something that happens on a regular basis. We're not gonna be upset or sad about it. It's just a regular part of the admissions process. And so students should be able to opt out of mailing lists um, by going into their student portals or applicant portals. Uh, there might be an unsubscribe option at the bottom of an email from a college or university. Um, and they certainly can reach out to an admissions office directly and say, thanks for the mail. I would like to not receive more in the future. Um, so certainly ways for, for students to go about this in the time of COVID, most of this is going to happen, is going to have to happen either through email or um, if some folks are using phone services at this point, the phone, but really email is the best way to be able to send in to admissions at mcallister.edu, just as an example, and say, hey, I appreciate the mail, but I don't want more at this time. 
All right, now on to articles four, five, and six, which concern seniors completing the application, how it works, what it looks like, what they can ask for and expect. Article four, a student will have the opportunity to apply early. Article five, a student will be given opportunities to have their application fee-waived. And article six, a student can always reach out to an admissions or financial aid office if there, if there are any questions about either application process. Now, Article 4 refers to something called early decision and or early action. If a student applies early decision, they can only apply early decision to one school. And if they are accepted, then they must commit to withdrawing all other regular decision applications at all other institutions. Um, with early action, students receive their admissions decision early, but they're still able to apply to early action to multiple schools most of the time. With this process, they're given the option to wait until decision day to commit. Both processes allow students to get an admissions decision early, which would look something like applying in the fall and receiving decisions in December or January. Now you'll notice the asterisk I have next to commit, and that's relevant to what's on the next slide. Pardon. Many schools may not send a preliminary financial aid package when you are applying early decision. And this can become problematic if you find out that the school you've committed to is not financially feasible for you to attend. In that case, don't be afraid to contact the admissions and financial aid offices to see if they're willing to work with you and your family or even potentially release you from your early decision agreement. Article five has to do with application fee waivers. Um, a student will be given opportunities to have their application fee waived. Most college applications require a fee and they're commonly around $50. And depending on how many colleges a student applies to, that can really begin to add up. Waivers are generally given to students who demonstrate financial need. Some schools allow students to even avoid paying the fee if they meet certain criteria. And some schools may even have their own fee waiver application process. Most students can expect a fee waiver if they receive some kind of government assistance, but there are plenty of other ways to qualify for a fee waiver. Um, if you are eligible for an SAT or ACT waiver, you can qualify for a fee waiver at many schools. You can request an admissions fee waiver from the National Association of College Admission Counseling you could contact the school's admissions office and request one directly from them. Some schools will waive application fees for applicants whose family members have graduated from there, which would be legacy applicants. Some schools will waive your application fee even if you've just made an official visit to campus. One of the simplest ways to avoid application fees is to just apply to schools that don't have them. Um, and there are many more ways that you can come about finding an application fee waiver if you're in need of one. Article six regards your right to communication. Um, a student can always reach out to an admissions or financial aid office if there are any questions about either application process. We really are here to be a resource to you, so please don't hesitate to contact our offices. Whether you have a question that you can't find the answer to online, or you're confused about any part of the admissions process, or you just want to speak to a real person about any concerns you might have, you can and should feel free to contact an admissions or financial aid representative. A college website will have the contact information for the office that you're trying to reach. And given our current moment, there are plenty of new questions to ask. For example, um, what are you looking for in an applicant? What's the right cultural fit for the kind of student that you're trying to admit? What sets your school apart? Why should I apply to you? What does student loan debt look like here? What events should I attend to learn about campus? And how do you support students after graduation? What's the return on education like? How do you handle outside scholarships? And some questions that have come up during our given moment, due to our given moment, um, may have to do with how a certain school may see pass-fail grades for the semester. Because of the way in which we've had to change day-to-day -day classrooms structure, many high schools are giving pass-fail grades for this um, spring semester. Uh, you might wonder if they have a virtual tour. And one of those silver linings that I said was going to come up 
is that many schools are strengthening their online resources for students trying to understand what campus life is like in lieu of visiting in person. Um, is there a way for me to talk to a current student, alum, or representative online? Like Ben mentioned earlier at McAllister, we have been expanding our resources to have one-on-one -on -one video chats with students and their parents as well. And what will happen if students can't come to campus in the fall? I think this is something that many of us are grappling with right now, but at the current moment, we don't have any plans to not be there and we are remaining optimistic. Now, how to find that contact information. There are plenty of ways to access the information online from a certain school's website. And we have three different examples here from three different institutions as to how to contact their admissions offices. First one happens to be McAllister College. And you'll see right up here, there's something that says apply, which gives you a good indication that some information about admissions will be available. Click on it and you can see right here that there's a place for you to connect with admissions. And boom, you have some general information for the whole office right here. But if you look over here towards Meet the Staff, you can get information for specific staff members. And once you click on it, so many individual staff members that you can contact personally in order to get their specific help. Now, the next school that we'll be looking at is Minneapolis Community and Technical College. You'll see front and center, they have admissions right here. If you drop down, you'll see a place where you can contact admissions. And you are suddenly at the contact information again. And the last school that we'll be looking at is the U of M. Admissions and aid, right front and center. Click on it and there are three different ways in which you can be admitted to the U of M through an undergraduate school, a graduate school, or as a professional student. Since we're working with juniors and seniors, we're gonna wanna look at undergraduate students. And now we're at the Office of Admissions for Undergraduate Education and we have something else that says contact. And here we go where we've got an email address, a fax number, an actual physical address, and if the question ends up, some, ends up being something that you actually can find the information for online, you have frequently asked questions right there. And now I'll hand it over to Ben for our remaining rights. Great, thanks, Niara. So um, now that we've talked about sort of where your juniors, rising seniors are at, um, a little bit about um, what seniors will be doing in the past few months, what your seniors have been doing the recent months, we're now gonna jump into uh, more or less what's happening on the ground right now with your current seniors and potentially what your current juniors can expect for next year when it comes to admissions decisions and financial aid. So articles seven and eight here will focus on the admissions decisions themselves. Um, article seven, focusing pretty exclusively on a student receiving notification of their admission status, that a student can expect to receive a decision along the lines of admit, waitlist, or deny. In some cases, a deferral is possible at McAllister, when it comes to regular decision, which is sort of the landscape we're working with currently in April, we will only admit waitlist or deny. But some institutions might defer a student's admission to winter entry or spring entry or something along those lines, if that's an option. At McAllister, we only have fall entry, so that's how we do things on our end, but there are many different options depending on what types of institutions your students are working with. And then Article 8, a student can always ask for more information about an admissions decision. Hopefully you picked up that the common theme amongst this entire presentation is there are ways for students to communicate with admissions and financial aid um, and with people on our end of, of the conversation here that students should really feel empowered communicating as much as they're willing to, as much as they want to. Um, so moving into Article 7 specifically now, we'll start with the waitlist and the denies. Uh, a deny, again, is pretty straightforward. It's the end of the road for a given college's application process for that student. In some very exceptional cases, there are institutions who may reconsider an admissions decision if more information comes to light. Uh, this might be initially initiated by a counselor like you all, letting us know, hey, you, maybe we missed something or maybe something drastic has changed within that student's record that would boost their application profile. Um, this happens very rarely, but it certainly is, is open to communication from you all on the counselor end and the student end. Uh, when it comes to waitlist decisions, 
Um, the chances of a student being admitted from the waitlist can vary greatly from institution from institution and from one admission cycle to the next for that matter. So the way that McAllister treats their waitlist might be very different than how Stanford treats their waitlist or how the University of Maryland treats their waitlist. Um, and even within year to year, it might be completely different. Just to give you a, a little bit of information, this past cycle, so for the uh, current first year class at McAllister, we did pull from the waitlist and uh, to be able to fill our class. But the year before that, we did not pull from the waitlist at all. And there's really no metric that decides whether or not we pull from the waitlist in a given year. It's just a matter of seeing what happens in the springtime to then decide, do we need to go to the waitlist in May, in June, whatever it may be. Um, so that can certainly have a lot of variation, which may create some anxiety for the students that you work with. It may create anxiety for you counselors as well, uh, not necessarily knowing whether or not the waitlist will be utilized. But students are certainly welcome to ask. You're welcome to ask, have you gone to the waitlist in previous years? How many students did you take from the waitlist in the previous years? Uh, what is, some students might ask, what is my rank on the waitlist? Not every college will do a ranked list. For example, McAllister, we do not rank students on our waitlist. We just have a general pool of waitlisted students that will then look to if and when we need to. Some institutions will actually rank where a student is on their waitlist. So your students and you as well are certainly welcome to ask that direct question if you'd like to. In the time of coronavirus, it is possible that waitlists will be larger than usual for many institutions. Um, since we're in early April now, not entirely sure what that's gonna look like come down the road. Um, leading into the next point here that some institutions, McAllister included, have moved back the deposit deadline. Um, several of your questions pre-webinar here were related to national reply day, which is usually May 1st. Well, because of coronavirus, things are a little up in the air. McAllister is one of the schools that has moved back our decision deadline, our deposit deadline to June 1st to give students a little more time to collect information, to make an informed decision. Not every institution, and in fact, a majority of institutions still are looking at that May 1st reply deadline. Um, but it's totally fine for students to ask, are you thinking about moving this? Can I get an extension individually? Whether or not that's related to an overall move back of the deadline, students should feel empowered to ask for an extension, especially given the situation we're working with, um, to, to allow more time to think about their decision. And then moving on to the fun side of things, the admitted seniors. Yes, hopefully you're working with many admitted seniors right now, helping them figure out what their best fit is given their different options. Um, when it comes to students who have multiple offers of admission, students will need to decide which school is best fit for them. Many factors go into that decision, as you are aware of, location, financial aid, areas of study that students are interested in, size of the student body, makeup of the student body, size of the school, things along those lines. There are, of course, resources available to learn about those factors online, visiting campus, if and when accessible, connecting directly with an admissions rep, uh, which is certainly accessible in the time of COVID as well. Um, visits are almost impossible in this current moment that we're working with. Uh, in fact, it is discouraged that anyone should visit campus, even as just a, a free walk around. Um, but there is a silver lining to that, being that there's a greater availability of online resources, um, that students really are able to find, hopefully, resources, virtual programming, the ability to chat with students or professors online to really make sure that this information is out there, that this information is accessible. And again, as I mentioned earlier, many institutions, McAllister included, have extended their reply deadline from May 1 to June 1. Students can ask for an extension beyond that, um, but it certainly is open to communication between the student and the admission office. Uh, deferring admission for a year to take a gap year is also an option in general, and during coronavirus is an option that a lot of students are certainly considering right now, uh, not knowing whether or not virtual learning or in-person learning will be happening in the fall semester. And then to the final two articles, and then we'll uh, address some of the questions that you folks sent in ahead of time. These two uh, bill of rights here will be spent on financial aid to round out our overall uh, 10 bill of rights. So articles nine or article nine uh, is focused on the fact that a student will receive a detailed explanation outlining their financial aid package and article 10, that students should feel empowered and should know that they have the ability to ask questions about their financial aid package, to ask for further clarification and some other things that we'll touch on as well. Uh, but starting with Article 9, a student will receive a detailed package outlining their uh, financial aid. We're actually going to take a look at what a McAllister aid package looks like, what an award letter and associated documents looks like. We're going to go through this fairly quickly, um, 
just to cover sort of the big points and what the purpose of these things are. Uh, but you'll be able to see what we send from McAllister to our students when it comes to financial aid. So to start with the first page of a packet that we will send to our students, what does the financial aid award look like? This is the actual award letter itself. I know it's, it's probably a little small on your screen, uh, but again, it's pretty straightforward. This is a financial aid letter noting Here's your uh, coverage that we're providing as far as grants, scholarships, loans, work study, if that's available, um, and what that breakdown of funding is for fall semester and spring semester, the total amount for the entire academic year, uh, some information about what this means um, and what the overall cost of tuition is and room and board are as well. Fairly standard letter, but something to know that, that you counselors likely are aware of that students may or may not be aware of is of course that every financial aid letter could look very different from the next. And being able to decipher these is certainly a tool and a skill that an entire webinar could be spent on. We're not gonna spend that time here, but just know that we'll get to Article 10 where students are able to ask questions about these types of letters. The second page that we then include with our financial aid award package uh, is continuation of the letter. It might include an explanation of you've been, um, you've been notified that you're uh, being requested for a verification of your financial aid by the federal government, um, which is something that some students are working with. And there are certainly challenges to that right now in COVID, which we'll touch on uh, in a few minutes. Our letter might note that, hey, we noticed that you have an older sibling who is in high school. If that older sibling is going to be in college and overlaps with your time in college, here's how much more money we would give you. Or on the other side of things, we notice that you have an older sibling currently in college. Once that older sibling graduates, here's how much money we will take back or, or not offer you because you're no longer paying for two students to be in a higher education institution. Moving on to page three then is the breakdown of what your McAllister bill might look like to parse it out even further as far as fall cost, spring cost, overall cost. What is your cost if you take on these grant scholarships and student employment? What are your costs if you take on loans? What does that look like? Um, fairly straightforward sheet here, so I won't spend too much time, but just breaking down what the overall cost would look like for a student and their family, given whether or not they accept the loans or whether or not they take on the student employment opportunity. Page four of the packet that we provide then uh, is about financing options. Page five, I believe is the same as well, where it really just summarizes, here's what a loan is, here's what it looks like at MAC. Um, here are the different kinds of loans. There's a tuition payment plan. What is a grant? What is a student loan? What is a scholarship? What, how do we accept outside scholarships? All this kind of information is information that hopefully colleges and universities are providing. If not, certainly students should feel empowered to ask about these types of things. What is a parent loan? What is the difference between a subsidized versus an unsubsidized loan? At McAllister, and I know many other institutions, we try to provide that information up front so that students and families have all that to, to learn from, to work with. But if it's not provided up front, of course, please ask. And then the final page of our award package uh, that we provide, page six, um, is again, fairly straightforward, just continuing what, uh, what do all these things mean and what does this mean for me and my family? And notice there is a contact us section as well to open up article 10 of the Student Bill of Rights, which is uh, asking for financial aid. The admitted applicants have every right to make inquiries regarding their financial aid award. These inquiries can cover a number of different topics. They might be follow-up questions related to um, how was aid awarded? Why did I not get merit aid? Or why did I not get more merit aid? Or, well, the need-based number is different than what I was expecting it to be. Why is that? Uh, can you help me understand why the number I had in mind as the student or the family is different than the number that you, the college, had in mind? Students can certainly ask for reconsideration of their financial aid package. Maybe the aid is less than what you expected. Maybe another school, another college offered more merit scholarship and you want to see if school A will match school B's merit scholarship offer. Um, maybe the financial situation has changed since submitting paperwork. This happens all the time in a regular year. And now given COVID-19, it happens much more frequently. Parents being laid off, students being laid off or furloughed uh, and, and finances just are much tighter right now. Um, so this is super, super important that financial aid offices and admissions offices are working together to make this as transparent of a process as possible, specifically because of what's happening right now with coronavirus, that it's important that students and families feel like they can ask questions 
that they can ask for reconsiderations that might be out of the out of the norm, um, because we are here to help as much as possible. Um, a student might ask, where do I find outside scholarships to help pay for college? And then another coronavirus related point, really the big one here is the what ifs. Well, what if my parent loses their job in the next two months? What if uh, over the summer something happens? What if the medical bills that my family is paying for someone, you know, for a grandparent, for example, what if those bills can no longer be paid? Then what do we do? What will you do as the college to help me, the student, out? These are all questions that, that I'm sure your admitted seniors and families have on their mind that they absolutely should feel empowered in asking of admissions offices and financial aid offices uh, specifically. Keep in mind, different schools will give different answers depending you know, for the same question. So it is important that, that your families know and your students know that it's important to ask the same question of all of their schools to which they've been admitted because they might be completely different answers. They might be similar answers, who knows. And that uh, really does bring us to uh, the conclusion. I know it's a lot of information um, and we did breeze through a good bit of it, um, but we will now answer some questions. Um, thank you all again for, for doing your questions in live time here and Adam and Jace will continue to answer your questions over the next few minutes. Niara and I uh, do have a few questions compiled from Adam and Jace, uh, given the questions you all submitted as pre-registration questions that we'll address in this moment as best as we can. Um, and then be respectful of time, of course, knowing that many of you may have something going on at the top of the hour, we'll try to wrap up on time as best as we can. Uh, so Niar, if it's cool with you, I will ask you the first question for you to answer. That sounds great. Uh, so the first theme that, that, that came up amongst uh, many of you counselors in your pre-registration questions was related to how this COVID-19 situation will have a impact overall on admissions requirements uh, for graduation, for, for application. What do we do with test scores? What are we going to do with grades? It's given that many students, many high school students will be applying in the next cycle with an entire coursework of pass fail grades as opposed to letter grades. What are we going to do with all that kind of information? So Niara, what are we going to do with that information? Well, you know, obviously we're all pretty concerned with various test states being canceled. The ACT, the SAT, um, even internationally, national exams and IB exams. And schools are really trying to be flexible with this to varying degrees. And from our perspective, um, as McAllister admissions representatives, we've been examining the possibility of being test optional actually for a couple of years now. And we will be coming on a decision to that soon. Um, so hopefully we may have more information about that for you in the future, but I know that that's something that a lot of schools are considering right now, but especially McAllister. Um, and with so many high schools and middle schools going past fail for this spring semester, um, a lot of us in admissions will have to take into account when evaluating student transcripts, what this change looks like, why it's there, and that it shouldn't negatively impact our assessment of a student's admissibility. Just in general, we are doing our best to work with students given what's happening because it's all very much out of their hands and we can only try to be as empathetic and understanding as possible because each applicant deserves their holistic full review. Did I answer it well? I think so. Okay, well, now I have a question for you, Ben. Do you now? Uh huh, I do. So, is the national reply day being changed? And how does that affect waitlisted students? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a fantastic question. So, um, yeah, great question. We, we did touch on this a little bit, but we'll certainly expand upon it uh, a bit here that. For some schools like McAllister, National Reply Day is no longer National Reply Day. That you know, McAllister and some others have moved their deadline back to June first, um, and some institutions have done that. I'd say the majority of colleges and universities are still looking at that May first deadline. As far as what that means uh, for waitlist is, that's a great question. At McAllister, we've had conversations about whether or not um, we will still pull from the wait list in early middle of May. I think given that a number for us specifically at McAllister, given that a number of our peer institutions are still aiming for a May 1st deadline, that we might know in early May or middle of May what our numbers are actually going to look like because students have had to commit to a peer institution or not to a peer institution, aka maybe us. 
Yes. Um, so waitlist activity is likely still to happen around that early middle of May for vast majority of institutions in the country. Now we'll see what happens over the next three weeks. Um, if the situation with COVID-19 continues to deteriorate, who knows, maybe more and more schools will push back their deadline to June 1st. Um, a lot of that is sort of wait and see mode at this point. So we're going to wait and see as much as we can generally um, and see what happens. But at least as of right now, even though at McAllister, we've moved back our deadline to June 1st, we think it's very possible and likely that we will still be able to think about the wait list around the early part or middle of May. Um, now, in relation to that, typically May 1st being National Reply Day um, means that students who are not ready to make a decision by that point, by May 1st, can ask for a deadline extension. There is really no nationwide coordination that happens for these extensions. Um, so students should still feel compelled to ask for an extension of whatever, whatever institutions they're thinking about. Um, especially in this situation, it's really important that students can, can convey and feel comfortable conveying that if they need more time, colleges will be flexible and allow you more time to make that decision because so much is unprecedented with this situation that schools are more willing to be flexible as much as possible uh, given the, the state of the, of the world in this current moment. Um, all this is subject to change, as I mentioned. Um, so we'll see what happens down the road. Um, but, you know, this is, this is, as far as this kind of topic of what is May 1st going to look like, we know about as much as you do on your counseling end of things that that we're trying to navigate this as best as we can prepare as best as we can and and just see what happens at this point um but yeah thank you for the question we are we we have one more question that we'll touch on here that came out of your uh, pre-registration questions counselors so thank you all so much for those um this next theme is focused around financial aid um what can students do about getting a financial aid reconsideration what does that process look like and asking for that given all these changes with coronavirus? Um, and on top of that, some students have been requested to complete a FAFSA verification process. Well, what does a student do if they don't have print abilities or if they don't have internet capabilities or if those abilities fall out over the next few weeks as, as, as finances become tighter and, and budgets become tighter, maybe those are things that drop off. Um, so Niara, what, what types of things can students do or can counselors or parents do for that matter when thinking about how do we approach a reconsideration? How do we approach a FAFSA verification? For sure. Well, each institution has their own process for reconsideration, though the general sense is that most higher ed institutions are trying, again, to be flexible with students and families just given widespread job loss, stock market dip, family members becoming ill. Um, and you can refer back to our Bill of Rights here, but students are always entitled to ask for a conversation with financial aid and can go forward from there as they see fit. Um, again, don't be afraid to contact those offices. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I'm probably saying it every day at this point. We are here as a resource to you to help you understand what this process is like, what you'll need from it, and what we need from you. Um, McAllister, personally, will be understanding the complications of this moment, the full complications of this moment. And if there's any logistical hurdle to FAFSA verification or any other part of the college application process, just let us know and we will work with you. And it seems likely that most other institutions will follow suit, um, but again, reach out and just understand that everyone is dealing with the weight of the way in which the world is changing and the way in which our future actions will be impacted by what is happening today. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that answer, Niara. Um, I do wanna reiterate as we wrap up here, uh, a couple things. First of all, uh, in this situation with COVID-19, we are all working our best on, on both sides of the conversation here, I'm sure, to really do what we can to make this as transparent and as efficient of a process as we can for not only your admitted seniors, but also your juniors who are entering this, this process with a whole bunch of questions, a whole bunch of unknowns that we on the admission side of things are gonna try to do our best to be transparent, to, treat, to be open, to be communicative about these things. Um, and that really that is the best thing that, that you, best message you can spread to your students and that you can spread to your, to your families as well is, 
we are here as as vessels of information please ask us all the questions in this current time because that's the only way to get this information and so we really will do our best to accommodate that as we can um please keep in mind that that this presentation again will be available for all of you um underneath the video screen there there is an opportunity for you counselors to download covid 19 counselor resource kit uh with all sorts of information details resources helpful tips that you can share with your networks um and with that i think we'll turn it back over to Brittany. Mm -hmm. All right, team, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to make um, a comment that you guys have provided such great trans, um, uh, transparent um, and honest uh, responses to the questions. And I just wanted to give Jace and Adam a shout out for their spitfire responses to the questions um, that you guys have been asking. I wanted to let you all know that if any of those questions um, that Jace or Adam did not get to, the rare chance um, that they did not get to your question, they will definitely be following up. Um, uh, the entire McAllister team will be following up with emails to make sure that everyone's needs are being met. So um, please feel free if you have not um, entered a question, um, you can do so um, at this time. But um, I have a couple um, of notes uh, that I wanted to um, share with you all before we head out. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to get um, your thoughts, Niara, your thoughts, Ben. Um, any general, you know, uh, you know, advice that you would give to A, counselors who are in the room who are assisting students, um, uh, and uh, uh, B, um, any students who may be in the um, uh, in in the audience, do you have any um, thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, I I guess I can go ahead first. Go for it. I would say just keep reaching out for that communications for that communication to your specific admissions officer to the wider office. Um, check the websites of the schools that you're applying to and that your students are applying to. Um, most places at this point have a COVID-19 landing page with all of their official statements and updates and things that they're trying to do to counteract that. Um, even most shopping websites have one at this point, so most higher ed institutions should have some sort of landing page for that information. Check out the virtual tours on the websites of these schools if you can. See if you're able to talk with someone online, whether it be video conference or maybe um, a phone call, something as simple as that. There are just so many ways that people are beefing up their resources right now. And if there is a Facebook group potentially for the college that you're applying to, see if you can join it. There are bound to be current students in there and lots of other programming that's happening in there as well. I know that McCaster personally is hosting a series of live events and student panels over the next few weeks. So feel free to let your students know or if you're a student who's been admitted to McCaster, please check those things out. Yeah, that was great, Niara. The only thing I'd add uh, just on a broader sense is, is stay safe, stay healthy out there, folks. This is a weird time we're all working with, but, but we will get through this together. Mm. All right, team. So I appreciate you all so much. I want to just bring to your attention, I will be following up with everyone with a link to the um, slides, the recording, as well as the counselor resource kit. I want you all to um, be aware that you can please feel free to share this with your students um, um, as well, or your, your counselors or your team. Um, uh, we want you all to be able to share this information um, uh, with everyone in your community. Uh, I want to also let you all know that Greenlight, we are moving forward um, to continue the conversation um, with uh, uh, how to really best cultivate relationships with admissions representatives, seeing as though um, many of our high school visits as well as college fairs have been canceled. Um, 
for the spring, we are having a continued webinar conversation with partners, um, uh, Pepperdine, and that will be next week, Wednesday, uh, April 15th at 2 p.m. Central Time. Um, we will follow up with you all with the link to uh, register as well. Um, I want to thank you, uh, send many thanks to the McAllister team. Um, you guys, uh, uh, never fail us in terms of your preparedness and um, just your uh, willing to show up um, for our community. Uh, Jace, Adam, uh, thank you so much for all your time. Um, again, team, if you all need to reach out to the McAllister team, they are on your side. They want to assist you. Um, again, they are representatives of McAllister, but they are uh, uh, staunch uh, advocates of college access. So if there are any general questions um, that you need to share with them or with the College Greenlight team, we're always available. And um, we really appreciate you all for being a part of the College Greenlight community as well. So um, uh, I will uh, leave you all with that. And uh, hopefully you all will be able to join our college block party April 28th, April 29th. Um, thank you all so much, and may the force be with you. Take care. Uh, oh, Brittany, yeah. just yeah. one thing. Early on in the chat, before we got started, um, Tiana Lewis from Nebraska said hello to me. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. She knows me personally, so I just wanted to say hello back. If you're not in the chat right now, hopefully you'll see this in the recorded version. Yes, to all the family members, extended family members, too. Hello. <laughs> oh, but all right. Um, thank you, team, so much. Uh, we'll talk to you all um, later. And please be safe. Um, and please stay home. And um, uh, we are all in this together. Um, all right. Signing off. Take care. Bye-bye.